innovation, imagination, wonder. These are just some of the words used to describe Dr. Harvey Passes. Dr. Passes explores interesting people and ideas that will stimulate you. He questions the people who develop, create, and employ novel concepts in business and everyday lives. He especially loves to speak with successful people. How did they do it? How can you do it too? So let's join Dr. Harvey Passes in his quest of wonder and curiosity as we watch Dr. Harvey Passes Presents. Get your paper, get your pencil, get everything ready, sit down, get comfortable. You're going to hear incredible information today that could just save your life or a loved one, even the life of someone you don't like. But let me tell you, I've got an extra special guest today, and the information is really of gigantic import. I like that, import. And I, I think that you're going to find this phenomenal. We're going to take a trip, and we're going to learn all about one of the cancers that exist. And you're going to learn about how, how it starts and what it does to you and how it can be treated how it can be cured. That's right, I said cured. And I have literally a world-renowned expert today, Dr. Morton Coleman, to discuss with us a dreaded disease that is now being treated called lymphoma. And you're going to learn about it. It's exciting, it's interesting. So instead of me going on and on, let me have you meet Dr. Morton Coleman. Dr. Coleman, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Are you kidding? For you taking, you, you're, I mean, I think I'm a busy guy. You're ridiculously busy. I mean, you're all over the world. You look at your clock. Hey, it's Tuesday, 10 o'clock. I must be in Belgium. You know, one of those kind of things. You're amazing. Um, let me just tell my viewer at home a little bit about your background, because if I give them your entire background, it'll fit into a huge book, and then the show will be over. So let's just begin a little bit. Let me tell you, this impressive gentleman, impressive. Dr. Morton Coleman, he's the director of the Center for Lymphoma and Myeloma, at the New York Presbyterian Hospital and also the Weill Cornell Medical Center. And he's professor of medicine at the Weill Cornell Medical College, which obviously is all in New York City. Dr. Coleman is considered and is an expert in the diseases of the lymphatic system, in particular lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, chronic lymphatic leukemia, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, say that three times fast, and myeloma. Dr. Coleman has been designated as one of the best doctors in America, which I know that to be a fact, and has authored hundreds of publications in these areas. He's played a major role in the development in what is the current, today, standard therapy for Hodgkin disease and the use of PET scans in the treatment of lymphoma and the employment of novel therapy in myeloma and the use of monoclonal antibodies, among many other achievements. Don't worry about all those words. You're going to get into them later and you're going to love hearing about it. He has chaired or served on many important and prestigious scientific organizations and committees. He's currently on the executive board and the scientific advisory board of the Lymphoma Research Foundation and is chairman of its medical affiliates board. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Coleman, all right, let's begin. Um, I, I got to know you because, unfortunately, I've had a number of family members who've come down with diseases that fit in your bailiwick. And you have been able to help these people over the years. And uh, indeed, extending one person's life from five years to 10 years when it was unheard of. And, uh, and, and now, I mean, you're taking care of another dear, dear loved one of mine and turning a, a dreaded disease into something, uh, at worst, um, a chronic condition, uh, uh, best cured, which is just amazing. So I thank you. Let's begin. What is lymphoma? Okay. Lymphoma is a uh, malignancy. Mm -hmm. it, it, almost all, in fact, all lymphomas are, in fact, malignancies. OMA stands, the term OMA stands for tumor. So these are tumors of the lymphatic system. Lymphoma. Right. There's lymphoma. The OMA. Right. There are other types of tumors, of course. There is, for instance, benign tumors and they're malignant tumors. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in the case of lymphoma, all of them are malignant, but they do follow very different courses. There are really more than one form of lymphoma. There are more than 35 different forms of lymphoma. So we have various ways of dividing these diseases into 
broad categories which allow us to handle these diseases more effectively but the one thing these thirty five different diseases have in common is that they will kill you if untreated not all of them will kill not all of not all of them and it's interesting that some of the malignancies the more aggressive lymphomas well let me backtrack go ahead let me just simply say that everything you learned about cancer goes out the window when it comes to lymphomas why is cancers of the lymphatic system that's a liquid tumor these are what we call liquid tumors let's first talk about the lymphatic system and then I'll try to tell you a little bit about lymphomas lymphatic system is a system composed of tiny little channels in the body very similar to capillaries of the circulatory system these lymphatic channels drain into uh, what we might call sentinels or lymph nodes. Mm-hmm. These lymph nodes are like forts. These are one of the first lines of defense against infection. Mm-hmm. These lymph nodes, uh, again, will sometimes get enlarged from infection alone. In fact, everyone has had a sore throat. The lymph node nice. swells up. Swells up my people nose. call them people call them lima beans. Some of them call them kernels, right. uh, but some call them glands. But they're really lymph nodes, so they're one of our first lines of defense. When we talk about lymphoma, we're talking about malignancies primarily of this system. Mm-hmm. Now it mm-hmm. turns out that we have there's been an absolute explosion of knowledge in the lymphomas based on developments in immunology genetics and molecular biology and we have a much greater understanding of these diseases where they start and so forth for every cell in the body there's a corresponding malignancy and for every form of lymphocyte there is a corresponding malignancy the intent of a lymphocyte which is a cell that we find in the blood system as well the intent of this lymphocyte at least the B lymphocyte is to ultimately become a plasma cell and that plasma cell, which is the most mature form of the B lymphocyte, mm-hmm. there are T lymphocytes as well, this B cell, this plasma cell, this mature B cell, is responsible for making what we call antibody. Mm-hmm. Which, which fights disease. Which, which fights disease. Now, they, the lymphocyte goes through various stages of maturation in the process of becoming a lymphocyte. Mm-hmm. And for each stage of maturation of these lymphocytes, there is a corresponding malignancy and they make up the various forms of lymphoma. Hence the 35 types. Since 35 are probably more now. Okay. okay. Now, <clears throat> now knowing that, uh, there are so many different types that we have to look at them in a much broader way. So the first thing we do is we divide lymphomas into what we call non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma. Is Hodgkin the name of a person? Yes, it is. It is. In fact, it was Thomas Hodgkin who discovered pr- it. Who dis- described these lymph nodes? There's a dispute of whether he actually described it okay. or one of his students okay. honored him by describing it. But regardless, uh, we divide these two this lympho- these lymphomas into two broad categories: non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Hodgkin, and Hodgkin lymphoma. Then we take the non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and when we say lymphoma, generally we're referring to non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and we divide them further into what we call Mm B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma and T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It is those B-cells that are responsible for the production of antibody. We find antibody in that fraction of the plasma or serum called gamma globulin. Mm -hmm. So when you say, I need a gamma globulin shot, shot, you're really getting a shot of various forms of antibody. So Again, that's to what fight the disease. Cells, right. And then there's T cells, which gives us what we call cellular immunity. Those T cells will fight various infections as well, such as fungi and tuberculosis and even some viruses. So we have T cells and, and we have B cells. cells. The overwhelming majority of lymphomas are comprised of B lymphocytes. Mm -hmm. I see. So I can see why now it's essential for the uh, oncologist to also be, for lack of a better way of describing it, a hematologist as well. That's right. To really understand blood and what's in blood. Right. Uh, Comment on that. Yes. Uh, Lymphomas are liquid tumors. And so the person who's interested in lymphomas is either a hematologic a hematologic oncologist or, or an oncologic, oncologic hematologist, hematologist. Right. whatever it is, he's in that general uh, borderline between these two uh, studies of so disease. So I, I want to make this, like Nixon said, perfectly clear right. so that my viewer watching at home understands. So what Dr. Coleman is basically stating is that in these liquid tumors, it's not as if there's going to be a big growth. 
that the surgeon's going to just cut it out. This goes all over your body because it's, it's flowing. It's, it's in fluid. Well, it's moving. That's correct. And the point to be made is that most lymphomas, B-cell lymphomas, as opposed to Hodgkin's disease, and they're very closely linked diseases, but they're not exactly the same because the way they spread is different. Mm -hmm. Most lymphomas, the overwhelming majority of them, tend to be widespread at the time of diagnosis. Ah. Patients get very upset. Do I have a little bit? Has it spread? Well, for the most part, they have already spread at the time of diagnosis, regardless of how early you make the diagnosis. But getting back to the B lymphomas, which right. comprise the majority of them, we then broadly divide them into indolent or low-grade lymphomas mm -hmm. and aggressive or high-grade lymphomas. Now, if you remember before, I told you everything you learned about cancer Throw goes out the window. The reason for this is the more aggressive lymphomas, the ones that you would expect to spread them most rapidly, they have a greater tendency to be localized than the low-grade lymphomas. And, but nevertheless, only about a third of the aggressive lymphomas are localized. Hmm. So even they, the majority of them at least, are disseminated at the time of diagnosis. The low-grade lymphomas, the ones that you wouldn't expect to spread, almost invariably are widespread at the time of diagnosis. Now there's even yeah. further in interest in these two broad categories. Those aggressive lymphomas, those that could kill you very rapidly, or the ones that are most curable. Hmm. So the most dangerous one is the easiest to cure. Is the easiest one to cure. Which is your aggressive B type. That's right, the ones that are very destructive. On the other hand, the low grade lymphomas, some the of which, which we don't know, the B cells. Oh, still was, was still the dividing the Bs. Uh, aggressive and indolent. Okay. Indolent meaning lazy. Mm -hmm. The low grade lymphomas almost invariably are widespread at the time of diagnosis, but they're not very destructive. Sometimes we don't even treat them initially, we just simply observe them and they're not curable, but they're easily controllable. Now, do people die with these diseases? The answer is yes, they do. But we are now curing the majority of our aggressive lymphomas. I'm using the term cure now for widespread. What's your definition uh, of cure? Cure is the disease does not come back in this person's lifetime. Really? We are curing aggressive lymphomas, the majority of them at this time, thanks to the development of some very recent new and novel therapies. And uh, we are controlling uh, the low-grade lymphomas to a much greater degree than we ever did before. I shouldn't ask you this question, but let's try to answer it quick, only because there's so much more to cover, right. and this is getting very technical, but I'm curious. Is the diagnosis and the distinction between an aggressive B and an indolent B made on histological, on looking at a microscope and seeing it, or is it done by symptoms? No, it's done by looking at it under the microscope and using very special immunologic, Dyes. genetic, and molecular diagnostic studies. Okay. And I want to point out that the pathology of lymphoma is very, very complicated. So if a patient comes down with lymphoma, it is very important for this patient to be sure of the diagnosis that that diagnosis, that that lymph node or has been reviewed by an expert pathologist in uh, the disease lymphoma. Okay, before we continue, because I, I, I know that you're very excited about this and you're learning about this and you want to know, my gosh, how can I get more information about this? I'm going to ask my crew periodically to throw an overlay on, uh, on the screen and you're going to get information about the Lymphoma Research Foundation, which will have all the information of which Dr. Coleman is, uh, is one of the people, the pioneers responsible for helping that foundation get going. And there are books there. There's everything you've got all about learning uh, about, about this condition and where you can go. So every now and then, throw it on the screen. So this way, people will have phone numbers, they'll have emails, and they'll have websites. Okay, come on back. Let's talk to Dr. Coleman. Okay, go Let ahead. me make a few commentaries sure. about the... There are a number of organizations in the United States that are devoted. These are voluntary organizations mm -hmm. devoted uh, to lymphoma. Uh, the one that I'm most closely associated with is the Lymphoma, lymphoma Research, Research Foundation. Foundation which is the largest foundation solely devoted uh, to lymphoma. Mm -hmm. There are other organizations as well. There's the Lymphoma Foundation, and also there's the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and they also are involved uh, in helping patients and in sponsoring research. Mm -hmm. The main thrust is research, uh, clinical trials. These are, the, these are the things that will get us to the point where we can say that all lymphomas will one day be, be curable. curable. Talking about curable. Yeah. Talk about the cure. Okay. What goes on? Let me tell you what's happened since so it's very exciting. 
Well, the first thing is, is that let me just point out that lymphomas are really like uh, the Rosetta Stone for the cure of other cancers. Mm -hmm. Many of the concepts, many of the treatments that were developed in lymphoma have now been applied to solid other. tumors and other cancers. No kidding. And because lymphomas are exquisitely sensitive to therapy, they're really our forerunner of, of what we can come up with. And so it's exciting to be part of this mm -hmm. uh, evolving story. Now, getting back to the lymphomas and the B lymphomas, because there's so many of them, the high-grade lymphomas, we're now curing the majority of these patients. Why are we able to do this? Well, first, we use combination chemotherapy. And the combination chemotherapy is based on two concepts. Which are? Which are? Number one is you use different forms of chemotherapy with different toxicities. So while you spread the toxicities out, you're getting an additive effect of these drugs all hitting the tumor. But sometimes they hit the tumor in different places in its life cycle, if you would. Oh. And so instead of just being additive in its effect, it's synergistic. Now what's even more exciting now is the advent of biologic therapy. We now Explain. have a biologic therapy. Mean? These are therapies that are much more targeted toward the tumor. We have an antibody, a monoclonal antibody, mm -hmm. and it would take me in half an hour to explain it to you, but you'll have to accept the premise that this biologic therapy, it's not a chemotherapy, is like a guided missile heading toward its target. Now, this guided missile will go straight to the lymphoma. And ignore everything else. And ignore everything else except for normal lymphocytes mm -hmm. because they're directed against an antigen, which is really like a beacon that says, I'm a lymphocyte. So it knocks out the tumor and the normal lymphocytes. And that's why you go into neutropenia. Well, no, no, no. Okay. We're talking about lymphocytes. Okay. Now, the nice thing about this is, is that this antibody will hit almost all lymphocytes except the very youngest and the very oldest, and the very oldest is the plasma cell. So we will knock out all no normal lymphocytes between the very youngest and the very oldest. That's where the majority of the lymphomas are located because the lymphomas represent different stages of cell maturation right. that have turned into tumor. So you can knock out these normal lymphocytes, but you haven't knocked out the young cell. So they can regenerate more normal lymphocytes. Meanwhile, these plasma cells are still producing antibody. The advent of this monoclonal antibody in the past decade has been an exciting page in the annals of oncology. It has enhanced our ability to cure the aggressive lymphomas, and it's enhanced our ability to control the low-grade lymphomas. Now, the way most low-grade lymphomas uh, eventually get into trouble is that they convert into a more aggressive lymphoma. And if, they're, if they convert from a low grade into a more aggressive Impressive. lymphoma, they're much more difficult to treat than if they came in de novo or brand new as, a, as an aggressive, aggressive lymphoma. Now, the median survival that people have bandied about for low grade lymphomas, particularly follicular lymphoma, which is the most common, has been about 10 years. But I'm here to tell you today that the advent of rituxan has changed this story altogether. Now, I'm a lymphomaniac. All I do is lymphoma in my office, and I'm in the trenches every day seeing patients. I do not see these patients with low-grade lymphoma, those that we can't cure but control, dying from lymphoma so much anymore. It'll be very interesting to see what the median survival of these patients now has become mm -hmm. in light of the fact that I know that these patients are absolutely living longer. So one could say, well, I'm not curable. The cup is half empty. Mm -hmm. But one could argue that the cup is half full because now we can prolong your life and turn this lymphoma, in, this low-grade lymphoma, into a very chronic disease. Most and in fact, I would say that the cup is not half full. The cup is, is now three-quarters full. Three-quarters full. You mentioned the word before, and the viewer watching at home might think, what? You said rituxan. What is that? Rituxan is the monoclonal antibody. That's okay. the name. That's the what we call the proprietary name. The name the, yes, the generic name is rituximab, okay. standing for monoclonal antibody. Okay, so that makes, makes great it's sense. It's a very exciting story. But what we are now developing, in addition, are, are small molecules, targeted drugs that will target the tumor and pretty much leave the normal cells alone. And this is the first of many monoclonal antibodies that are coming down the pike. 
So just like we have combination chemotherapy, combinations of various chemotherapy agents, we're now having combination, we one day can look forward to combinations of monoclonal antibodies. So the story is really very upbeat and very exciting. It sounds like the term should be nanochemotherapeutic uh, treatment. Well, these aren't quite nano uh, <laughs> uh, 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 drugs. But these are pretty good sized molecules, but they're targeted. Now what's even more impressive is that we can take that monoclonal antibody and we can put a warhead on it and, and, and now provide what we call radioimmunotherapy. Mm. Radio, radioimmunotherapy is a monoclonal antibody with a radioisotope on it. Let us say, for instance, you want to shoot down an airplane. Well, you can shoot it down by directing the missile at the plane and mm -hmm. hope that the impact will shoot it down. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to shoot it down, you would add a warhead so it impact and the warhead would Close explode. Right. Well, that's exactly what this radioimmunotherapy is. The, ana the antibody has a radioisotope. The antibody goes straight to the tumor, and the radioisotope, and the, ra and the antibody can kill the tumor, but the radioisotope also kills it Finishes with it very directed very microscopic radiation to the tumor. And what's that called? And that's called radioimmunotherapy. There are two products on the market, Bexar and Zevalin. And these products have worked when the monoclonal antibody by itself hasn't worked and when chemotherapy hasn't worked. Let's, so it's very exciting. Let's talk, and it is, let's talk about now, uh, this is all good stuff, but now at what price, I'm not talking money, at what price does an individual pay for going through this treatment? Uh, you hear stories, oh my God, I don't know if I can go through this treatment. I'm afraid the treatment will kill me. Um, I'll, I'll be nauseous all the time. I'll be sick as a dog. I'm going to lose my hair. Discuss, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly here. Well, there are some drugs which don't cause alopecia or hair loss. But it is true that people will lose their hair. But now we have very effective drugs to prevent nausea. Nausea is no longer, or vomiting is really not a very big problem for us in lymphoma therapy. Very few people get nauseated. And, and if they do, it's very short-lived. Mm -hmm. So uh, from that point of view, people don't pay that price. Now what is also very interesting is that these chemotherapy agents can knock down your blood count, knock down your white cells, which mm -hmm. fights infection, and knock down your red cells which carry oxygen and make you, a, and the loss of red cells is mm -hmm. called anemia. Right. Well, we have drugs now that can help reverse the drop in the white cells, and we have drugs that can even help reverse the drop in the hemoglobin. So it's not the same as it used to be in the past. For instance, this one, we have several drugs that will keep up the white count so that we don't see the number of infections that we used to encounter as a result of using <laughs> these drugs. So not wow. only have we developed more effective wow. therapy, but we've developed more effective ways of preventing uh, the side effects from these particular uh, therapies. Let's talk about other advanced tools. Describe what is a PET scan and how is a PET scan used to help diagnose or evaluate? Well, that's an ex excellent question. Thank and you. It's a, and, it's yeah. a, <laughs> and, and again, it's another exciting component Let's talk of about what's it. happening in lymphoma. Now, it turns out that we do CAT scans, and CAT scans can tell us what a tumor looks like, mm -hmm. how big it is, but it doesn't tell us how aggressive it is, right. and it doesn't tell us how active it is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we give chemotherapy, we can cure the, cure the cancer, but the tumor will stay still sort of swollen. It'll be like a white dwarf star. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's scar tissue. It's like a I fight it getting hit in the ear and having a cauliflower Colorful, ear. Yeah. The ear may not any longer be inflamed, it's just enlarged. For many years, we didn't know what to do with these people, and sometimes we'd irradiate those tumors because we didn't know whether they were active disease or right. whether it was just sterile disease. Now, what it turns out is that the PET scan can tell you about the activity of the tumor, which becomes a very, very helpful tool. Now we have combinations, PET and CAT scans, that are done simultaneously. So that not only can we look at the size of the tumor, but we can also look at its activity. Now interestingly, it turns out that the more aggressive tumors uh, show up on the PET scan a great deal more than do low-grade tumors. What you're really looking at is the uptake of glucose, and without getting into all the complicated biochemistry, 
tumors take up sugar more avidly than do normal tissues because they use a different form of metabolism that's not as efficient as normal cells this is not a prescription not to take sugar when you are at when you have lymphoma because there are reasons why you should not alter your diet well these aggressive tumors again burn more sugar so it tells you the uptake of sugar by using radioisotopes the aggressive tumors take up a great deal more than the low-grade tumors and so when we do a PET scan on a patient whom we may think has a low-grade tumor and we see that on that PET scan there's one area of very high uptake we'll say hey wait a minute maybe there's an area of high-grade tumor in this background of low-grade tumor. I see. It gives you the ability. Now, I'm going to say something to you, by the way. Excuse me for interrupting. We've got three minutes left. Okay. Do you I, believe it? I cannot believe it. Go ahead. It. You believe but it. But I want to just tell you one more Go exciting ahead. aspect, Go. and then we'll call it a day. <clears throat> Go ahead. By using these PET scans, what we are now finding, and this is, these are very early data, that when we give a patient chemotherapy with an aggressive tumor, that after just one cycle of therapy, and this applies also to Hodgkin's disease, or two cycles of therapy, that we can predict who's going to be cured mm. because that PET scan will go from positive to negative. Mm. And in our data, what we have found is that those patients who turn negative early within one or two cycles, within a month or two at the most, mm -hmm. those people who turn negative, very, very few of them relapse from their disease. So within a matter of a month or two, we might be in a position to say, you're going to be cured or you're not going to be cured from this treatment and maybe we should go modify. on to something different to modify interesting exciting you know, stories in, in it in is exciting therapy. okay in the two minutes that you have left uh, take a minute of it and give me a summation right now I know this is a very quick thing we've done a thumbnail sketch right. summation is there hope here what do when 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 my viewer turns off the set what is that person going to be thinking that uh, they're doomed or they're not doomed or what well if you have to pick a malignancy lymphoma or Hodgkin's disease is the one to pick. If we don't cure you, we can certainly keep you alive for many, many years to come. This is a really upbeat story, an exciting story, mm -hmm. as I said in the annals of oncology, right. because we are curing many more people than we used to, and for those that we can't cure, we're keeping them alive for long periods of time. We're not talking years now, we're talking about decades. So this has been an exciting evolution. When I graduated from medical school in 1963, for instance, in my textbook, it said in the classic Cecil and Lerb textbook of right. medicine, yeah. for instance, that Hodgkin's disease was an incurable disease. And, for in, and today, we cure 80 to 90 percent of all patients with wow. Hodgkin's disease. Is that a great testimonial to what's going on? This is an upbeat story on. for people. That's and terrific. A, a, I am going to end this right now with the best compliment I can give you. You've taught me a lot today. Thank and you I very thank much. you very much, Dr. Morton Coleman, for taking time to come down from your extremely busy schedule and to share with my viewers all about what's going on and with a message of hope. Right? Absolutely. Will you come back? Absolutely, and thank you for having me. Oh, it's terrific. Next time you come back, we're going to get a lot of information on the disease called... Multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma, which has always been one of those dreaded diseases, and it still is. But you're going to discuss that and... Uh, and to see if there's any hope with that disease as and well. And it's another upbeat story. That's, that's great to hear. That's fantastic to hear. Thank you so very much. You're and so again, thank you for explaining and teaching. I hope that you got a lot out of it and you learned a lot and you realized that there is hope. And uh, maybe before we sign off, we'll have uh, some more information put on the screen where you can get more information about this on uh, lymphoma. Anyway, Dr. Pass is saying, whatever you do, just like Dr. Morton Coleman here, do it with passion or What's the use? Take care. See you again next time. Thanks, Eric.